Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Sunday school. If you got your Bibles open to Mark chapter 4, spoiler alert, we're getting dangerously close to finishing Mark chapter 4. Promises, promises. I know, promises, right? Empty promises. All right, we'll start this morning with our question that we do each week. What is God doing in you through his word from the portion of Mark we've studied so far? Open the book. God doing in you from the portion of Mark we've studied so far. <clears throat> Resist the urge to help your classmates. <clears throat> yes, Dad. I was talking to the podcast yesterday. So it's just a we have a podcast. Out. Yeah, the podcast. Oh, that's cool. You know that. Audio thing that yeah. you do. Thanks for recording those. I appreciate that. I'll do it. Okay. Yeah. Did you Thanks hear the joke from last week? Yeah. It yeah. sounded great. <laughs> you didn't touch a thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, you know, uh, how we insert ourselves into the parables yep. um, kind of reflects our me centric, you know world philosophy that essentially our country has. You mean I'm not the most important person in the universe? I listen. <laughs> he won't say no. But. <laughs> to us, sometimes yes. But no. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. Uh, so that was just a, uh, as many times as you read it, it's like the way our, our world view or our culture influences us in the way that we look at scripture yeah. is um, uh, relentless. And so we have to be relentless about turning it back uh, to Christ. Yeah. That's right. You may hear that theme this morning, mm -hmm. later on today. Glad mm -hmm. that sets you up, man. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? God doing in you through this work from the portion of Mark we've studied so far. I've realized that saying. not having all the answers is okay. <gasps> now you're that talking to a like, mathematician, so say, and you're that scaring was me my here. like organizational <laughs> planning to do list part be really bad. Yeah. Um, but asking questions to the Father is what is intended. Good. 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 Um, can you say that again as soon as I finish with the last verse today? Awesome. Not having all the answers is okay. All right, great. I want to end on that one because that's a good segue. So we want to, let's, let's uh, read Mark chapter 4 this morning. Mark chapter 4 this morning. Mark 4. And he began to teach beside the sea. A very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold, and sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside everything is in parables so that they may indeed see but not perceive, and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. 
and others are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And he said, The kingdom of God is as if man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows, and he knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, and the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. And he said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches, so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples he explained everything. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, that the boat was already filling, but he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Still, every time I read that, it's just, wow. You know? Just, it's just amazing. Absolutely amazing. All right, so I want to start with a question that I'm not going to answer, but I want to ruminate in our heads for just a little bit. So the literary structural observation is there on your handout. So this is the fourth parable in Mark chapter 4. So how are they connected? I talked about this a little bit last week at the end of the lesson. So how are they connected? So we'll start with verse 30 today, the parable of the mustard seed. So, and he said, with what can we compare? <clears throat> With what can we compare? So this is subjunctive. It's one of the indicators that we're actually in a parable because it's a possibility of a thing. So what can we compare the kingdom of God, the kingdom? So we talked about this, I think, a bit last week, right? The three possible uh, ranges of definitions for the word kingdom. It can talk about royalty. So who's that? Can we talk about the royalty. Who's that? The king, right? Yes. Uh, it can talk about the rule. So what's that? The law, right? And then the realm. What's that? Say it again. The boundaries, right? The physical boundaries and also the... It's like the people. Yeah. So you can think about how, how far does this realm actually go. So uh, one of the things that I want you to get in the habit of doing, because it is good exegesis instead of eisegesis. Exegesis is taking what the text says and pulling it out. Eisegesis is going in with an idea and forcing our idea into the text, is to think through which of the three or which combination of the three of these definitions is Jesus actually talking about. So we'll, we'll go through uh, a verse or two here, then I'll come back and I'll ask us this question, which one is he talking about, the royalty, the rule, or the realm? So with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable? So again, we're in the middle of parables. Shall we use for it. So at the top of your next page on your handout, it's a question, right? Now think about, oh, I don't want to say that. I was going to say, think about the lunacy of this question. That's not it. Think about the impossibility of the disciples to be able to answer this question. Who knows the kingdom? Jesus knows the kingdom, right? Who does not know the kingdom? 
Decide, and who is asking this question? Jesus is asking this question, right? Yeah. So how many of you have had uh, in college a college level course on number theory? So if I started asking you questions about number theory, how would you do on that test? Why? You don't have you don't have it, right? So so just picture the God of the universe asking you a question about what the kingdom of heaven is like. We're not going to do well here, right? Which is one of the reasons that I love Jesus' teaching style, because he takes something that is so incredibly well known and he uses it to help us understand something that is unknown. This is the concept of a parable. So taking the known to help us understand the unknown. And every time that I dig in and I think through that concept of parables, I go back to Genesis chapter 1 in my head and I wonder, did God create the world just like that so that one day Jesus could say this parable? And what's the answer? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, I think he did. Because this is all connected. This is not a disconnected like, oh, you know what? Jesus just had this idea. I bet we could have a parable about a mustard seed. No, Jesus made the mustard seed. It was his idea. <laughs> He's got this. He, he would understand of anybody in the universe how to actually compare the kingdom of God. Now, there's a word that we like to skip over in our literalness of Bible reading. And it's the next word that's highlighted there in verse 31. It is like. So yes, I want us to be literal, but I also want us to be literate. And I want us to miss words that impact what we're talking about. Is Jesus saying the kingdom of heaven is a mustard seed? No, he is not. It is like a grain of mustard seed. So this is a comparison here, right? So it is like a grain of mustard seed. So um, how big, how big is a mustard seed? So this was the best picture that I could get for scale. Like it's tiny, right? Yes, Miss Star. statement that Jesus makes next. Uh, a grain of mustard seed, which when sown, this is again subjunctive, so we're the possibility of being sown on the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Now, um, I'm not going into a biological treatise on uh, whether or not Jesus was scientifically right or not. I will ask you the question, who created the mustard seed? Uh, who created all the other seeds? Okay. So um, my initial bent is to believe whom? Yes. Uh, and what we do sometimes is we assume that this is exactly what it looked like in Jesus' day. Which Darla just helped us understand is not necessarily the case at all. Um, there is a scientific principle that most uh, non biblical believing scientists uh, adhere to, and it's the idea of continuation. Is that 
However things occur right now are how they have occurred always going backward, which is just uh, lunacy. That, that's a good place for that word. That's a good place for that word. Uh, so I found a really good article on uh, answers in Genesis. Uh, are mustard seeds the smallest or was Jesus wrong? And I would argue that there are more possibilities for the answer than just these two. Uh, but the author does go into quite a bit of detail on this. I'm not going there. That is not the point of the parable. Is Jesus' uh, scientific exploration into the size of mustard seed? Um, I'll give you another not the point of the parable. Albert uh, is out today. He's in New Mexico. He sent me a video clip from a uh, someone who was standing behind a pulpit, and he had a Bible open. It looked like a Bible. And I believe he called himself a preacher, but he was taking uh, extreme liberties with the scripture. And I, I believe he was trying, he was trying, Luke, he wasn't doing a very good job, but he was trying to teach on the prodigal son. And he came to the conclusion that the prodigal son's problem was that his mom was nowhere in the story. <laughs> Which would imply that Jesus was a poor parable teller. Because sometimes we need to think about the implications of our statements and how they do and what they do to Jesus. And he went on and on about uh, the woman's place. It was just awful. Totally missed the point. Totally missed the point. The point of the prodigal son is not about the mom was not there. It's about the dad is there. It's about the dad is actively seeking and looking for a restored relationship because it is a picture of the Heavenly Father and that the Father is actively looking for restored relationship. It's a beautiful picture of familiar relationship and this guy drug it through the mud because he focused on the wrong thing and the wrong thing in this parable is the size of the mustard seed. Does that work? I'm scared to smack this pulpit because I don't want to damage it, but I was going to there, but this is as much as I'm going to do right now, so there you go. I know Doug made it and I'm just like, I bet it could take a beating, so. <laughs> <laughs> You'll fix it, right? <laughs> yeah, you will. That's cool. <laughs> it, is, it is a sturdy piece of equipment, let me tell you. All right, so let's get back to the point. So verse 31, it is like, what is like? The kingdom, right? The kingdom is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Verse 32 Yet when it is sown, so passive, so something's being done to it, when it is sown, it grows up. It gets, it gets taller and becomes larger. It gets uh, thicker in diameter. It becomes larger than all the garden plants. And that is just, um, you guys do not hear me gripe about the ESV very often on a translation. This is not a really spectacularly great translation of this word. It, it really just is much closer to vegetables. Um, and I don't think about mustard as a vegetable, uh, but this is the comparison that Jesus is actually making here. Because a mustard uh, seed can actually grow up into a mustard green. green. It can also grow up into a mustard tree uh, and be quite substantially large. Uh, so the bigger than garden plant and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests. This means to camp down or to have protection in its shade. So given what we know about Jesus' agricultural parables in Mark chapter 4, we are talking about the what again? He's trying to tell us it's like what? The kingdom, right. And what is happening to this small thing when it is planted? It's growing. So what do we learn about the kingdom? It grows. That's right. It grows. And it grows what? Very large in relative size to the original. Now, thank you for smiling. Because this is really good news for us. Because if the kingdom remained small, guess who's not in the kingdom? Hi. We're Gentiles. <laughs> we love the parables where the kingdom gets bigger. Because this is Jesus going... It gets bigger. We get in because of bigness. It is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Now, I do not think the parable of the mustard seed is an overly complicated parable. 
What I want to focus on for a couple of minutes here is verses 33 and 34. Because this is one of those beautiful little insights that Mark gives us. And Mark actually gives us a lot of these. He'll, he'll have a, an abbreviated version of Jesus' teaching, and then he'll have a bit of a commentary on it, which is super helpful. Because some of the other Gospels will do a lot of words and words and words and words and words about Jesus' teaching, and then there's not a lot of little commentary at the end of it. And I love these because these kind of give us insight into how, how things actually occur. So verse 33, uh, and with many, so, with, okay, so verse 33. Do you see the word chi is at the, the beginning of the verse 33? This is another one of those ands that the ESV, and almost every translation skips them because there's just too many of them. It just sounds awkward in English. So, if, and with many such, what's highlighted there? Of this sort, of this type, of this kind of parables. So what's he talked about so far? He's talked about, Sowing seed in chapter 4. He's talked about lamps. He's talked about seeds growing and being harvested and mustard seeds. Would everybody who heard these parables understand these things? Well, they would know. They would hear what he said and they would know what he said, but they wouldn't understand the intent. That's exactly right. Would they be familiar with the things he was using in the parables? Yes. yes, that's a much better question. Thank you. I saw everybody answer no, and I was like, I've asked a really poor question because I was looking for a yes. So thank you. Uh, yeah, so Jesus uses really basic things to describe things that are far more complicated. So with many such, with many types of parables like this, he spoke, so the imperfect, he spoke the word to them. And then there's this crazy little phrase, as they were able to hear it. So at the top of page 127, the last page on your handout, as they were able, this is the Greek uh, verb uh, deutamine, very close to deutamus. This is something that has the power or the ability to occur. So as much ability as they had to hear it, what would he do? Yeah, he'd speak to them. With as much ability as they had to hear, he would speak to them. And then we get to verse 34. He did not speak to them without or separately or apart from a parable. So who's he talking about when he says he did not speak to them without a parable? Who's the them? The crowds. The crowds, right. Does this make sense? Because we left the crowd early in chapter 4. But it's fairly clear here that we're not talking about Jesus speaking to his disciples only in parables, because why do we know that? We have other evidence elsewhere in the Gospels where he didn't speak to his disciples in parables, right? Yes, this is really helpful. Good. All right, let's keep going. But privately to his own disciples, um, I, when, when I read through the New Testament and I read the Gospels, there are many times that I want to look at the disciples and call them idiots. Uh, because they do just stupid stuff, right? And then I hold the scripture up to my face, and I go, well, I do stupid stuff, too. <laughs> and I'm, I'm kind of glad that my stupid stuff isn't recorded for, like, billions of people to read. It's, it's, it's helpful. The Greek word there for privately to his own is idios. Um, not saying they're idiots, but the Greek word looks a lot like it. <laughs> it's not what the word means. It just means pertaining to yourself or one's own. But privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. I love these last couple of words here. Uh, he explained. It means to solve further or to decide. So how many of the parables did the disciples get to hear the explanation for? All of them. Now, do we have in the Bible the explanation for all the parables? No. We actually don't have the explanation for most of the parables in the Bible. But there's this other little phrase that shows up in, uh, later in the New Testament where the Scripture talks about the Holy Spirit helped the disciples remember everything that Jesus taught. And if you hang out with somebody for a few years and you aren't a rabid note-taker, and these boys weren't, okay? 
because it would have been one, prohibitively expensive, and two, that's just didn't, it's not what you did. Right? Um, unless you were going to write everything down, you're going to forget some stuff. So Jesus has a personal backstop against them misunderstanding something and that he is going to provide an explanation. And then he puts the Holy Spirit as an additional backstop behind that to make sure that they're going to remember everything. Now, I know like uh, three things about baseball. Uh, one of them, it's on right now. Um, uh, two is that Mitch roots for the Cardinals. And that is not going well right now, right? No. Okay. <laughs> And three, uh, and my dad had to explain this to me like four times because I'm a basketball guy, I'm not a baseball guy. But when somebody hits the ball uh, into uh, mid one of the fields, like two thirds of the way out there, right? You see how much I know about baseball. Uh, what typically, I know, it's sad, isn't it? <laughs> Jenna's like, just stop. You're just good. <laughs> that, that something really odd happens because whoever's closest to it runs up to it to get it, but there's somebody what? Somebody behind him just in case he misses it. And this happens in the infield. They do this with the catcher when they're throwing somebody, trying to throw somebody out at home. These guys are moving around all over. It's not just, I've got my one spot and I'm right here. There's a tremendous amount of protection and help and support. And what I want to tell us this morning is that we have the same Holy Spirit that Jesus gave to the disciples to help them remember everything that Jesus taught. And when we get frustrated and aggravated and confused and like, I don't understand this, guess whose job it's not to understand the scripture? It's not our job. That's the Holy Spirit's job to illuminate so that we can then understand. So, it is right for us to be frustrated when we try to do and take the place of God. Does that make sense? Yes. Cool. So, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. Now, what was I going to ask you to say? It's okay that we don't understand everything. It is okay. Would the disciples have understood without Jesus doing this? No. The, the guys who wrote, like, this much of the Bible would not have got it had Jesus not personally explained it and the Holy Spirit helped them understand it. It's okay. It's really okay. Don't give up when things got hard. Now, Dave asked me four weeks ago, five weeks ago, in an email, a fantastic question that I think has a super simple answer, but I want to make sure that I answer the question. You don't even answer, remember the question, do you? Yeah. When you guys email me things, I don't always answer right away. Because I'm thinking, I'm going to answer that a few weeks from now. Work. Dave's question was, is a story the very best way to communicate the kingdom of God? It's a great question. Right? Why would Jesus not have just said, here's what it is. It's this and this and this and this and this and this. Why didn't he do that? And why would they not have been able to understand if he had just explained what it was? I would fast forward to later on in the book. You are going. Where am I going? Well, I was going to go to Revelation. Come on. John is trying Come to on. explain, and he can't even explain it Come without on. using analogies. Right. So it, what? What they? And he what? And he what? And he was there. And he was there. Right. So right? Even, like even, I'm looking at the thing, and I, I'm like, I don't. Know. So they, to go, no, like, I, I've got to tell people about this. I mean, they were already and, mad at him anyway. So if he had told them those things, they thought he was crazier than what than what they already thought he was. So that they wouldn't have understood anyway. There you go. <laughs> Look back at verse 31. What's the third word in verse 31, Miss Shelby? How do you put words to something that's that incredible? Like. It's like. That's close as I can get.
one of the most interesting ways from a teacher's perspective to create interest and engagement, and if, you're, if you ever do any public speaking, don't say everything. Leave a little left. Because people will continue to be engaged with the topic because they're trying to resolve it. Right? If you ever lead any teams, don't give everybody all the answers. Leave some wiggle room for Go do that. Hey, yes, ma'am. Question. My sister-in-law is Jewish. I, I, sorry. This My sister-in-law is Jewish. Okay. And so everything with her family, everything is Jewish. Okay. Historically, her family is all Jewish. I'm, I'm going to come up. I can barely hear you at all. Sorry. Yeah. Historically, her family is all Jewish. Okay. Historically, her family is Jewish. Jewish. Okay. Converted to Judaism or Christianity? To Christianity. Okay. So everything that they thrive on, believe in, thrive their life is out of the Torah. Uh, no, but okay. That's what she Yes. I, I know that's so, what they say, but they've stacked a whole bunch of crap on top of it. Right. It's hard to get to the actual thing when you stack crap on top so, of it. So they would not have necessarily, because I know. Luke, don't use crap. So, great question. Uh, that would be a pretty substantial misunderstanding of first century Jewish education because the children would have been educated in the entire Old Testament. Yeah. 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 To varying degrees, but there would have been a substantial emphasis put on identification of the Messiah, which is one of the reasons that Jesus went to so much trouble. Uh, I'm doing this to fulfill the prophecy. I'm doing this to fulfill the prophecy. I'm doing this to fulfill the prophecy. So these are all connected um, ideas. Cool. Um, I would suggest to us that when somebody uh, summarizes their religious beliefs, many times what we see is a one a missummarization and or a two a misunderstanding of the lens in which they're looking at that particular thing. And I would argue that that is true many times for us as well. So I'm going to throw rocks here. It's, I'm a glass house attendee, so there's that. All right, so um, one more question, and then we'll stop. So I asked you to think about which one of the definitions of kingdom do you think we're in, or is there a combination of some? Is this definition of kingdom that Jesus is describing as starting as something small and growing to something big, is that talking about the king? No. No. Did, now, wait, wait, wait. Didn't, wasn't Jesus a baby? And didn't he grow up to a full-grown man? Yeah. yeah, but this has nothing to do with that, right? We all good? What, this is the what? The same Yes, very much so. Thank you. Is this talking about the law? Does this, feel a lot, does this talk about the realm? Let's talk about the realm. Right. So we want to make sure that we have an understanding of what kind of bucket we're in uh, when we look at specific words that have a variety of definitions, and that is good for us. So next week, we will start, Lord willing, uh, your one blank is Mark 4.35. And Lord willing, the Cardinals will have won a few more, and Mitch will... Uh, Lead us next week. <laughs> we'll see. All right, but your homework this week is to pray for help in understanding Mark, to hear Mark multiple times, to think about Mark often day and night, to talk with someone dead or alive about Mark, to share your insights about Mark, and to invite a member and a non-member. Here's what I mean when I say invite a member. Look around the room. Who's not here today? Go check on them. Go check on them. And then if you want to know more about our class, you can go to the link at the bottom of the page, OurSundaySchool.com. You should have a weekly update at your table. So if you do, or if you don't, find a table that does. Uh, read through these. Make any updates. After you have prayed as a table, you are dismissed to go.
and worship the one who is different from all others, the great teacher, our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. So thanks for coming to Sunday School today, guys.